evening, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in. Alright, <clears throat> go ahead and get started here. Got a little late start today, but the Lord is good, His mercy endures forever. Hallelujah. Facebook messing up again. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> I pray that you had a wonderful, blessed day, and that the Lord is still doing great things in your life and life for your families. Praying for your uncle that God continue to touch his body, his mind, and his spirit to do a miracle in him. I know God is able. It's nothing too hard for our God. So if we go into a word of prayer and we'll get into our lesson tonight. Our lesson tonight is in chapter 10. Chapter 10 in the book, Bait of Satan. Chapter 10. 107, page 107, and then on the Kindle version, it is page 94, if you follow along with the, the Kindle version of the book. So we're going to go ahead with the word of prayer. So Lord God, I thank you for being good and merciful towards us, your people. I thank you, Lord God, for this opportunity to share your word once again. We thank you, Lord God, for how you hear us when we call upon your great name, O oh God, and you answer us according to your will. Father, we thank you right now, God, for this class tonight, oh God, that we ask that you speak to our hearts by divine revelation, bring insight, revelation, understanding of the word of God that we'll be able to apply to our hearts to bring change in our lives from the inside out, perfect the thing that concerns us, cleanse us from sin and iniquity, oh God, wash us clean in the blood of the Lamb, and we thank you, oh God, that you're on our side the reigning king. We pray for those who are afflicted in, in hospitals and in hospice, oh God, those that you... Father, who's been going through all types of illnesses, oh God, in this season, that you would do a miracle in their lives, oh God. We know that you are the chief physician, and that you're able, Father God, to heal all manner of diseases. And we come in faith, believing God, in the power of the blood. We plead the blood of Jesus tonight, oh God, over our loved ones who've been afflicted, Father, with different viruses, sicknesses, and diseases, cancer, oh God. We bind the spirit of cancer, God. And any other illness, God, that come against the people of God and release the blood of Jesus, God, to heal and deliver and set them free. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you, Pastor Denise and Shonda. God bless you all for tuning in tonight. We're on page 107 in the book. If you follow along in the book, page 94. Uh, and uh, Kindle version, if you have the Kindle version of the book, The Bait of Satan, we're in that page. God bless you, Sister Davis. Thanks for tuning in tonight. I'm going to open up with a devotional today uh, from my book, Jesus Calling, from my book, Jesus Calling, I'm open, uh, devotion from here. And it says, I am your strength and shield. I plan out each day and have it ready for you. Long before you arise from bed, I also provide the strength you need each step of the way. Instead of assessing your energy level and wondering what about what's on the road ahead, concentrate on staying in touch with me. My power flows freely into you through our open communication. Refuse to waste energy worrying and you will have strength to spare. Whenever you start to feel afraid, remember that I am your shield. But unlike an intimate armor, I am always alert and active. My presence watches over you continually, protecting you from both known and unknown dangers. Entrust yourself to my watch care, which is the best security system available. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. Amen. I love that devotion for today is so beautiful. Reminds that God is our strength and our shield. He's our protector. The word says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I be afraid? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom sh shall I fear? And truly, God is on our side. If he's for us, he's more than the world that's against us. So tonight, we're in chapter 10. We're going to talk about Jesus offended some people by obeying his father, but he never caused an offense in order to assert his own right. The author says, I re recently read your book, 
the beta Satan. And I want to tell you that it has totally set me free in an area of my life that I thought would never, I would never be free from. I just want to say thank you for writing that book because it has changed my life. That's by C.R. Tennessee, one of the commentaries who, who wrote that. Lest we offend them, lest we offend them. In Romans chapter 14, Romans chapter 14, I'm going to turn there in my Bible. Give me one second here. Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Romans chapter 14, verse 13. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. And it says, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. So we have to be careful of how we walk daily in our life for the Lord, that we not cause a stumbling block or cause anyone to fall who's supposed to be a child of God, even a, even a non-believer. We can put a stumbling block in people's ways by our mouth, by our attitudes, by the way we treat people. That's a stumbling block. And many times we do things because of emotions. When our emotions are out of whack, sometimes we'll say things we didn't mean to say, hurt somebody, feel it, that's a stumbling block. You can cause a person who's a sinner who may be contemplating about turning their life over to the Lord, but because of your behavior that you display before them in the midst of an offensive situation, you didn't handle it properly, and you caused that person to change their mind by giving their life over to the Lord. Because they, they begin to say, if that's how a Christian is supposed to live and respond when people do them wrong, I don't want to be a Christian because I can do this by myself without Christ. So we have to be careful of the life that we live before other people because people are watching everywhere you go. You go in a grocery store, you go to church, you go to the movies, wherever you go in a community, wherever you may be, somebody is watching you as a child of God. And sometimes, I found this out in my own personal life, that sometimes people will test you. They will test you to see how you're going to respond. What's your reaction? We talked about in previous lessons how a child of God must be one who must be proactive instead of reactive. Thank you, son, for tuning in tonight. My son is on tonight, too. We have to learn how to be proactive instead of reactive. Reactive is impulse. So whatever happens to me, I'm going to respond according to my impulse, and I'm going to give you a piece of my mind. I'm going to cuss you out. I'm going to say what I feel at that moment in the heat of the argument. Because of the attitude of the flesh, have not been subjected to Jesus Christ. And that's what the Lord is saying, that we don't want to get to the place where we cause other people to stumble because we're out of order with God. So we have to die to ourselves daily. That's why Jesus made it clear to his disciples, if any man desire to come after me, let him first deny himself take up his cross daily and follow after me. Our author says we have just finished discussing how Jesus offended many as he traveled and ministered. It appears that almost everywhere he went, people were offended. In this chapter, I want to look at the flip side of this. Jesus and his disciples had just returned to Capernaum. Or Capernaum. They had completed a ministry circuit and had come for short but much needed rest. If there was any place that could be considered a base for his ministry, it was in the city, to my Capernaum. While there, Simon Peter was approached by an official in charge of collecting the temple tax. Does your teacher not pay temple tax? You find an account in Matthew chapter 17, verse 24. Matthew chapter 17, verse 24. And he says, Peter answered, yes. And he went back to discuss it with Jesus. And isn't it something how, because of the way Jesus presented himself as the son of God, everywhere he went, he talked about love, he talked about compassion, talked about loving your enemies. And when people mistreat you, you got to do good to them in spite of, no matter how people mistreat you, you still need to be an outward expression of the love of God. And people were so offended 
because he claimed to be the son of God, came from God, incarnated in the flesh, and they had a problem with who he was. So they always trying to find a way to entrap him in a conversation or catch him doing a deed on the Sabbath day so they can have some accusation to come against him to stone him or put him to death. So Peter goes to talk to Jesus. Jesus anticipated that the tax collector's request, so he inquired of Simon Peter, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take custom or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? Then from Peter, and Peter answers, and he told him, he said, then the sons, he said, from strangers. Then Peter told him, and Jesus said, then the sons are free. So in other words, the taxes are from strangers, not from the sons. So Matthew chapter 17, verse 25 and 26, talks about this. And Jesus is making a point with Peter that sons are free. They are not the ones who, uh, who supply the taxes for the temple. They are the ones who enjoy the benefit of the taxes. So the tax collectors, they won't collect from their own sons, their own children, but they collect from strangers who come to the temple to pay homage to the Lord or pay tribute to the Lord. They live in palaces that taxes pay to maintain. The sons eat the king's eat at the king's table and wear and wear royal apparel, all provided by the taxes. They live free, and they freely provide are freely provided for. Why? Because they are partakers of the inheritance of the tax collector, just like your children. Any benefit you have as an inheritance in your family. Your children benefit from it. So when you pass away, or if you have a business, I'm putting it this way, if you got a business and your children come to your business, you don't charge your children for what they want from your business because they're part of your, your, your family. They're your heir. So whatever they want, I, rem I remember my father had a, had a store, a clothing store back a few years ago, several years ago. And every time I would go to Gary to visit, always left with a brand new suit, brand new shoes. I had left with money. Why? Because I was an heir. So anything that he acquired for success, I was a partaker of that success. Do you follow me in this? Do you follow me? So being a partaker, any benefit I have, my children could benefit from it because we're connected. The same way Jesus was making the message clear here about the tax collectors, they even they eat from the king's table and wear royal apparel. Why? Because they're provided by the taxes. This official received the temple tax, but who was the king or the owner of the temple? In whose honor it was it built? The answer: God the Father. So God owned the temple, and God's being honored in the temple. Peter had just received the revelation from God that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. On the basis of Jesus asking Peter, if I am the son of the one who owns the temple, then I am not free from paying temple tax. Then am I not free from paying temple tax? Of course he would be exempt. Why? Because he's the son of the one who owns the temple. He would be totally justified in not paying taxes. Yet, watch what he says to Simon Peter. In Matthew chapter 17, verse 27, Nevertheless, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take out a fish that comes up first. And when you open the mouth, its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take it and give it to them for me and for you. Isn't it amazing to keep from offending the tax collectors Jesus, even though he was the son of the Father God who owned the temple, he, he did a miracle to provide just what he needed to pay for the taxes. And that's so awesome how much God loves us so much, he's willing to pay the price for you when you owe a debt. He had paid your debt to a zero balance because he loved you. He had just proven his liberty. But in order not to offend, he said to Peter, let's pay it. It was yet another confirmation of his freedom when he instructed Peter to go to the fish 
and, and take the first fish that comes up and in his mouth he will find money. God the Father will even provide the tax money. That is so awesome. God provides the tax money. So you can't tell me what our God can't do. When we find ourselves in a predicament, a financial predicament, and we're trying to figure out, trying to examine our finances and trying to rationalize how can I switch this around, this account around, that account around to pay this one bill, and it still doesn't measure up. Until you begin to seek God, you'll never measure up. So we seek God and tell God, God, here's this bill. I'm going to take this bill. I'm going to lay it down before you. I'm going to take the anointing oil. I'm going to anoint this bill. I'm going to trust you with your word and decree in the name of Jesus, God. You shall pay my bill. Every debt shall be paid in full because I'm trusting you in your word. That if I seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness, all these things shall be added to me. So, God, I will not lack anything, but I gain everything by faith in Jesus Christ. So you begin to decree the word of God and you walk in faith with what you have and all of a sudden God multiply it and you wonder where did the extra come from? I've seen it happen in my life before. Had bill to pay, didn't know how I would get all the money and God multiplied. Finally, I had more than I thought I did. Why? Because I trusted God in his word. And that's what God would do for you, my brother and my sister. When you trust God at his word, he would not leave you nor forsake you in your time of need. Doesn't matter what that need is, God will provide according to what? His riches and glory. Not your riches, not your finances, not your way of doing things, not your way of fixing it. He will fix it according to his will. And all he's looking for you is to have faith that he can do it the size of a mustard seed. Trust in God. And a lot of people really don't know what that mustard seed faith is. Mustard seed faith is a ridiculous faith. Because it's a little seed, so solid, you cannot easily break it. But yet he's saying your faith can be so solid, so rooted and grounded in God, that no matter what you trust God to do in his word, he says, when you pray, believe you shall receive those things you ask for in prayer, and God will do it. Why? Because I'm trusting God in his word. Ask me shall be given, seek you shall find, knocking the door will open unto you. Why? Because I'm trusting God in his word by faith. Jesus is the Lord of the earth. He is the son of God. The earth and everything in it are created by him and are subject to him. So you can't tell me that God cannot turn your situation around. Doesn't matter how critical it may be, how difficult it may appear to be in your eyes, God has a way of doing something supernatural. The super God will interact in your natural situation and cause a miracle. I believe God can do anything but fail in our lives because he can turn anything around for the glory, for his glory. The word tells us, and we know that all things work together for the good to them that love God and are the call to go into his purpose. If God called you, you can guarantee he qualified you. If he qualified you, he justified you. If he justified you, he acquitted you. Why? Because you're a benefactor of the grace of God. And the grace of God, because Jesus Christ is the Lord of the earth, the Son of God, everything belongs to him like it does to the Father, because him and the Father are one. Anything I need God to do in my life, by faith, I can trust God in his word and watch God manifest. We have several people been diagnosed with cancer. Several people have lost their lives from cancer. But it does not mean God can't heal. Just because God chooses not to heal the way we expect him to heal doesn't mean he can't heal. Sometimes God will heal the individual by releasing them from their suffering. 
And we wonder like, why God, you let my loved one be taken away? Why God, you let this happen to my family member? Why God, is so much pain and agony? Why God this? Why God that? And God says, the secret thing belongs to the Lord, but the mysteries he reveals to the son of men. So God has some secret things, some secret ways of doing things in our lives we never understand. But he said, the mysteries, the things of the gospel, that lines with the word of God, I reveal to the sons of men. Why? Because we're children of the most high God. So God, there's some things I will reveal to you, but then some things you can't handle. Therefore, he knew the money would be in the fish's mouth. He did not have to work for the money because he was the son of God. Yet he chose, he still chose to pay tax and not offend them. We offend God every time we doubt God. Here I just said, we offend God every time I allow the spirit of doubt to get in my mind and start acting upon it. Because you're telling God your grace is not good enough. Your power can't work in my life. Your power can't work in my loved ones. So we offend God. When the word tells us that we are to meditate in the word of God, keep it in the midst of thy mouth, keep it in your heart, don't let it depart from you. So we got to speak that word. We got to stand in the word. So the word will make you prosper, give you good success everywhere you go. Why? Because we got to believe God and his word, even the last stroke of the hour when the doctors have shook their head, so that we have done all we can do. There's no more we can do for him or for her. So we, I, I'm just done. I don't know what to say, but go pray. Sometimes that's the best thing we can do when the doctors have shook their head and said, I don't know how the answers. I don't know what's going to happen. I can't fix it. I can't heal them. I can't deliver them. But I know a God who can. His name is Jehovah Jireh. The God who has more than enough provision for every individual. So whatever my need is, he's Jehovah Jireh who will provide. So I got to believe God like when Jesus called the money being the fish's mouth. I got to believe God for the supernatural to manifest his power in our lives. It's been so much pressure since the beginning of the year coming on us and our church. And God been showing me that the weights I cannot bear alone. So we have to get to the place where we realize there's so much pressure, but God gave me revelation. Pastor preached about it many times, about the pressure. When you're going through the pressure, don't lose your mind. When you're going through the pressure, don't you give up. Because a lot of times, God will let you experience pressure in order to bring forth the anointing. If I never go through obstacles and trials in my life and tests, I will never be in a position to receive the anointing. Because I trust God's word. Because I believe God's word. So when I'm being squeezed, it's like I'm getting to the place like the walls are closing in on me. Nowhere to escape. All I can do is recognize where I'm at and call the name of Jesus and tell God, I need your help. God says in the midst of the pressure, there's a releasing of the anointing that's coming forth out of your life to empower you to go through the pressure. It empowers you to go through the storms. It empowers you to deal with the affliction. It empowers you to go through the issues of life and keep on trusting God and his word. My God, my God, my God. Sometimes it gets testing, it gets frustrating, become burdensome, you feel abandoned, get lonesome, it becomes overwhelming, get headaches, body aches, all these things because you're dealing with pressure. But when I realize if I turn that same energy of focusing on all the issues 
and the things that are affecting me and begin to glorify God in the midst of everything, the pressure releases. I woke up this morning. I had so much pain in my neck and my shoulders and my lower back. And I put them on a prayer line at 7 o'clock. I couldn't get up. And then one of the sisters called me at 7.30 to find out was my dad coming on the prayer line. So I called my sister, got him on the prayer line, and I went on the prayer line. And as I went on the prayer line, and I began to trust God, to obey God, to do a devotion on the prayer line, and to pray, the pressure released. The pain in the neck subsided. The lower back subsided. Why? Because that's what the enemy wants to do is afflict you and keep you bound. And when you fight through, that's why well, you got to keep on fighting. You keep on fighting. Keep on fighting. Because when you fight through the pressure, you're telling the devil you're not winning this victory. You're not getting the power in this situation. Because I'm trusting in my God who fought the battle for me, who says by his stripes I am healed, who sent this word to heal me and deliver me from all destruction. Therefore, I'm standing on the word of God. He said, I'm the Lord God that healeth thee. So he promises that when I'm afflicted, he will heal me. Then guess what? It will manifest only by faith. If I turn my focus from dwelling on myself and all the problems on my life, in my life, around my life, take that same negative energy and put a praise on it. Begin to magnify God. Begin to praise him. Lift him up. Exalt him. God will begin to turn things around. Many times in an instance, it'll manifest because of your faith. He, he told many people when he healed them, be it done to you according to your faith. So where's your faith tonight? Where's your faith? In the same Jesus we saw in the last chapter offending people and making no apologies for it. He proved he was exempt from the te temple tax but said lest we offend them and go pay it. It seems as if there is some inconsistency or is, or is there. Our answer is found in the next verse. So you go to Matthew chapter 18 verse 1 to 4. Matthew chapter 18, verse 1 to 4. At the same time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child to him and set him in the midst of them and said, Surely I say to you, unless you are converted, check this out, and become as a little child, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever humble himself, humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Isn't that amazing? Because it seemed that it was some inconsistency with Jesus paying the taxes, disciples had a question. Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus made it clear. Unless you be converted. Unless you be changed from the inside out. And become humble as a child. You would not enter the kingdom of heaven. That's who's the greatest in the kingdom. The key phrases here is whosoever humbles himself. A little later, Jesus amplified this by saying, Who's, whoever desires to become great among you, let him be a servant. My God, I'm going to turn to this one. This is really good. This is really good. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 through 20, and 28 through 28. Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 through 28. Hallelujah. I mean, 26, correction. 26 and 28. So he says here, so, but it shall not be so among you, but whosoever will be the greatest among you, let him be your minister. 
And whoever will be a chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. That is so awesome. A ransom for many. Because he says, whoever among you want to be great, let him be a minister. So if I want to be great among you, I got to serve you. Because the way up is down. The way down is to get up. Because when Christ allows you to come down and humble yourself, he exalts you. So if I want to be great in the kingdom of God and I humble myself, the word tells me, it tells us that the greatest way to be exalted is through humility. But he also tells us that we got to be careful because we have an adversary. 1 Peter 5 and 8. 1 Peter 5 and 8. In the Amplified Version, it says like this. Be sober, well-balanced, and self-disciplined. Be sober, well-balanced, and self-disciplined. Be alert and cautious at all times. So you cannot be walking this life as a child of God precariously. Just lack of daily going through life. What's going to happen, going to happen in case of Ra Sara. He says, you got to be cautious. Guard your heart. Proverbs like four, 4 and 8, I think it is. Guard your heart for how the flow of the issue of life. He says, be cautious all the time that the enemy of yours, he identifies, we have an enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion. Fiercely hungry. The devil, the enemy of yours, the devil prowls around like a roaring lion. Fiercely hungry. Seeking someone to devour. So to be humble, I'm cautious. I'm alert. I'm sober in mind, heart, and spirit. I'm being aware of my surroundings. Being aware of what the enemy's trying to attack me with. Being aware of the temptation and trials that come to me. Because I'm trusting God in his word. But then he says, verse 9, verse 9, 1 Peter, uh, 1 Peter 5, 1 Peter 5, 5 and um, 8. And then verse 9 says, but resist him. Be firm in your faith against his attack. Rooted, established, immovable, knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being experienced by your brothers and sisters throughout the world. You are not to suffer alone. So when you recognize that if I'm going to walk in this life with Christ, then I have to be careful to guard my heart. I have to be careful to be alert of the adversary who looking to find me weak, to find me vulnerable, to find me lack, lackadaisy, find me sitting on the sideline resting, not paying attention. Because the same suffering many of us go through as children of the Most High God. We all going to suffer this life, but one thing about it, you're not alone. Because Jesus Christ is with you. Not only is he, not only is he with you, but he dwells in you. And Christ in you is the hope of glory. Then it goes on verse 10. After you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who imparts, who imparts his blessing and favor, who call you to his eternal, own eternal glory in Christ, will himself complete, confirm, strengthen, Establish, establish you, making you what you ought to be. So we have to be on guard. We have to be alert. We got to be humble as children of God. We got to serve. You want to be great in the kingdom? Be a servant. Says, wow, what a statement. He did not come to be served, but to serve. He was the son. He was free. He owed, he owed no one anything. 
He was subject to no man, yet he chose to use his liberty and freedom to serve. What about you? Your liberty and your freedom we have in Christ Jesus. Who are you serving? Who are you helping? Who are you guiding? Who are you leading? Who are you strengthening? Who are you encouraging? Who are you help, trying to help change? If you claim to be a child of the most high God, do you have to serve one another? I remember the account. Jesus came to the disciples and demonstrated humility by getting a basin to wash their feet. And he bent down, began to wash each disciple's feet. When he got to Peter, he said, no, Lord, you can't do this to me. I'm not worthy of you washing my feet. Jesus responded, said, unless I wash your feet, you cannot be part of me. Because it's very important to be a servant and not to be served. And that's what we have to be in Christ. Where every day we're allowing the Holy Spirit to lead us in an attitude of servanthood. An attitude of servanthood. To serve one another with the love that God has demonstrated towards us by serving us. By bringing us redemption, bringing us salvation, cleaning us up, washing us in the blood of the Lamb, giving us a new name, a new nature, a new attitude, a new life. Because he served us. And we have to do the same thing to help others be liberated from a sinful life by serving them with the gospel. Amen. Liberated to serve. Liberated to serve. We are exhorted in the New Testament as the sons of God to imitate our brother, to have the same attitude we see in Jesus. We're exhorted to have the same attitude like Jesus. For you, brother, have been called to liberty. Only do not use your liberty as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Galatians chapter 5, verse 13. For you, brother, have been called to liberty. That means freedom. Only not to use your freedom as an opportunity for your flesh, but to love, to serve one another. We have been called to serve. We've been created to serve. And a lot of times we get arrogant, we get haughty hearted, we get stubborn, we get rebellious because I done worked my job, earned all this money in my job to live a successful life so I can get everything I want to please myself. And I don't have to help nobody else because I choose not to. And the Lord says, you are to use your liberty to love one another by serving them. So if you see a brother, I, I love when in Matthew chapter 7, we get a chance to read that whole chapter, talks about judging and serving. Jesus makes it clear that we are to do unto others, we have them do unto us. But then he says, when I was naked, did you clothe me? When I was hungry, did you feed me? When I was thirsty, did you give me drink? So for in so doing, what you done to the least of them, you done unto me. And then disciples say, Lord, when did I see you naked, hungry, and thirsty, and clothed you, and gave you drink, and fed you? He said, when you done it to the least of them. Because there are so many people, a kind word, a friendly handshake, giving somebody some food, giving them a ride when they need a ride. It's an attitude of serving. Whatever means the way God uses you to serve somebody or might call somebody at the right time, they need a word that God has given you to speak to them, to encourage them. You never know how you may stop somebody right in the track of contemplating suicide. And many times we get in the attitude, we hear the Spirit of God put on somebody in your heart to call them, to encourage them, even pray for them. But because of our pride, 
we resist the voice of the Holy Spirit. And we don't do it. But then it comes back to you again. That's one thing about God. God loves us enough to be a God of another chance. So you miss the first chance. He'll provide the opportunity again to do the same thing again. You miss it again. He'll provide another opportunity again. Until you get to the place, you keep rebelling, then you get into a place of your heart becomes callous, it becomes resisting to God's voice. You can't hear God's voice no more because you don't put stoppers in your ears stop hearing his voice. Many times people put spiritual stoppers in their ear called earplugs. So spiritual earplugs in your ear so you can't hear the voice of God. And God is saying tonight, don't allow yourself to be ensnared by your own words, by your own attitude, your own way of living. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. Be obedient to the Holy Spirit. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. That means to sadden because you resist him. Holy Spirit leads us to do certain things for the kingdom of God. Don't oppose him. Surrender to the Lordship and authority. Allow him to guide you, as the word says, into all truth. It is a guarantee he will lead you in the way of the God that ordained for you to go. Another word for liberty is privilege. We're not to use our liberty or our privileges as children of the living God to serve ourselves. We're not to be serving ourselves. Liberty is to be used to serve others. There's freedom in serving, but bondage in slavery. Freedom in servery, serving, but bondage in slavery. A slave is one who has to serve, while a servant is one who lives to serve. There's a difference. A slave is forced to serve. Don't have a, have a choice in the matter. But one who is a servant has a choice to live a life serving someone else. Let's look at some of the differences between a slave attitude and a servant attitude. Let's look at the difference between a slave attitude and a servant attitude. A slave has to serve to get. A slave does the minimum requirements. A servant reaches the maximum potential. A slave goes one mile. A servant goes an extra mile. A slave feels robbed. A servant gives. A slave is bound. A servant is free. A slave fights for his rights. A servant lays down his rights. I have seen many Christians serve with a resentful attitude. They give grudgingly and complain as they pay their taxes. They still live as slaves to the law from which they have been set free. They still live as slaves to the law from which they have been set free. They remain slaves in their hearts. And the reason why, because the attitude is not right. We're going to stop right here. We'll pick it up next week. But we got to get to the place where we recognize the sin in our hearts. That as servants of the Most High God, I have the right to humble myself before the Mighty God. I have the right to serve His people with the same generosity and love that He poured into my life. So when I give into the church, I'm not giving out of necessity. I'm not giving grudgingly. I'm giving out a response to the love that God has given towards me and demonstrated towards me by allowing me to earn the money I earned through whatever avenue I got it. And I'm trusting God that when I give in obedience that I'm releasing blessings on everyone around me, even myself because of my obedience. And that's what God looks for. It's a choice. That's right, Pastor Denise. True, because he looked for the choices. He's looking for people 
to make a righteous choice to humble themselves, to do what the word instructs us to do by giving a response to the love God has demonstrated towards us. For the word tells us while we get sinners, without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. When he knew we couldn't get ourselves right, we couldn't clean ourselves up, we couldn't change our lives, he demonstrated an act, a random act of kindness. A random act of kindness he demonstrated by laying his life down for his friends. So no greater love than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. He calls his friends. My brother, my sister, he calls us his friends. Not only are we his children, but we his friends. And that we are to demonstrate the same love as his friend towards others, that he would come to know Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. They too could become his friend as well. So Lord God, tonight I thank you for your word today. I pray, oh God, it convicts all of our hearts to take a moment to examine our hearts, to see where we come up short in our faith, where we come up short in our walk of humility, that you forgive us, God, cleanse us, change us, Purify us, saturate us in your anointing, break strongholds, remove the bondages that we no longer be bound in slavery, but we be free agents and moral agents in Christ Jesus to serve you as our Lord and Savior and serve one another for the same love you gave to us, O oh God. And I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. I pray that something has been said tonight that would encourage you to stand on the word of God, to trust God His word, to keep you humbled, keep you submissive. Don't have a resentful attitude. Don't have an unforgiving attitude. Don't have a prideful attitude. Don't have a stubborn attitude. Because those type of characteristics is of the enemy. And that's the very thing the enemy will use to keep you in bondage. Is that type of attitude of resentment where you refuse to repent, refuse to ask God to forgive you for your sins and iniquity, refuse to get things right with God and yourself, but continue to go down the pathway of destruction. The word tells us there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. And many people choose that pathway because they oppose God by not surrendering to his lordship nor his authority. But I encourage you tonight, be a servant. Then you don't have to be a slave to the things of the world. Continue to go the extra mile. Then you won't limit yourself. Continue to give. Then you won't feel robbed. Continue to be free. Then you won't be bound. Continue to lay down your rights. Then you don't have to fight for your rights. Because when you lay down your life for Jesus Christ, guess what he does? He stands up before you. The rights and privileges that come from him reveals to you through the power of the Holy Spirit. So anything you need God to do for you, he would do it by faith, according to his word, as we trust him. So if anyone have any questions or comments tonight, any questions or comments? Hallelujah. God bless you. To Wanda, her, God bless you. Thank you for joining. Uh, Mr. Denise and Deborah. I mean, Mr. Deborah, God bless you. Frank Connell, God bless you tonight. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Any questions or comments? I pray this is helping. I pray this is helping because we need to hear this word in order to change our lives every day to live the life God wants to live. And we're going to continue to keep trusting God in his word and keep on providing for us what we have need of. Because one thing about God, when you give to God what he wants from you, he don't mind giving back to you what you gave to him even more and abundantly. That's the kind of God we serve. I want, as always, if you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, the word tells us, Romans 10, 9, that if thou shalt confess in thy mouth the Lord Jesus, Believe in thy heart that God has raised him from the dead. 
thou shalt be saved. St. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever shall believe in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. It's your choice tonight to make a decision to follow this Jesus that we're talking about, that you would not be an offense to him by the life that you live. But you can humble yourself before the mighty hand of God and watch God change your status, change your level, change your life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And all you have to do is pray this simple prayer with me. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I repent of my sins. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. And ask Lord you come into my heart. Forgive me for my sins and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Now come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. And I thank you for saving me in Jesus' name. Amen. If you pray that simple prayer, the whole host of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner that made a decision to turn their life over to the Lord. Reminds me of the story that Jesus told his disciples by a man that had a hundred sheep and he lost one sheep. He left the 99 to go find that one lost sheep. And when he found that one lost sheep, he came back and rejoiced because the one sheep that was lost has now been found. And that's what God done for us, his children. He saved us. When we're yet in a place of being lost, didn't know God, didn't want to know God, didn't care about God until we found ourselves in a place we had no choice but to run into God. And he changed our status. He saved our souls. He redeemed us from the pit of hell and gave us new life that's found in knowing him. To God be the glory. Amen. Amen. So I encourage you tonight, if you have the book, go ahead and read the book ahead. Continue to read the book, The Bait of Satan, Living Free from Deadly Offense, from the Trap of Deadly Offense, and allow the Spirit of God to minister to your heart. I guarantee the more you read this book, it's going to bring some changes in your life. It's going to even going to invite some attacks in your life. I found out I got attacked more and more from reading this book. The more I read this book, more attacks come against me. But check this out. The more tax, the greater the grace. The more the power of God works in my life to protect, guard, and keep me in the will of God. That the enemy can do me no harm. And guess what? He does the same thing for you, my brother, my sister. When you trust God in his word, it's a guarantee that the Lord will be a shield on about you because you fear and you trust him. And I'm not talking about fear like in frightened. I'm talking in respect and a reverence for God, for who he is in your life. And it's a guarantee that the Lord will keep you. The Lord will bless you. The Lord will turn his face towards you. The Lord will lift his countenance upon you, and he will give you peace as you trust him at his word. So the Lord says the same. We resume again next week, Tuesday, 6 o'clock hour. To start all over again with our lessons. I got four lessons left in this book. This book, this book entitled has 14 chapters. We're at chapter 10. We just started chapter 10 tonight. So we have four more chapters to go that we'll be done with this book. And then after this book, I'm praying that God will lead me to go into another book that will help bring changes in our life as well. I know most people, they, they go through the one Bible study that says uh, going through the Bible in one year. I, I was going to do that, but the Lord kept taking me in another direction. So I'm believing God, whatever his will is to be done, to teach what he wants me to teach, that will be effective. Because I don't want to just teach anything out of routine or out of religion. I want to teach what God instructs me to teach. That's going to be an eye-opening and a heart penetrating to bring changes in all of our lives, to bring conviction to our hearts, to want to live right for the Lord. So the Lord bless you. May you have a great night. May, may the grace of God, the sweet communion, the Holy Spirit, Rest through the Bible with you and me, henceforth, now and forever, till we meet again. Have a good night. God bless.